Ladies and gentlemen, much has been written. Nearly everything has been said. But still, we come back to the story of Marilyn Monroe. She is known as the one with the wiggly walk. The tantalizing temptress. Now, when people say this, this sex symbol thing, I don't quite understand. To me, symbols have always been something you clash together. Yes, yes, dear viewers. She really is one of a kind. I've always had too much fantasy to, to be only a housewife. She made the screen thunder with unparalleled glamour. In Hollywood, she is royalty. The people made me a star. No studio, no person decided that, but the people did. From then on, I became her. I became Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn's life began as Norma Jean Mortensen. She was born on June 1st, 1926, and raised in Los Angeles, California. She never knew her father. Her mother, Gladys Pearl Baker, worked as a film cutter for a consolidated film industry. My mother, she had some, you know, mental disturbances. I was very young when she was taken away. I live with some very kind foster families after that. But when you're that small, you just want to call every woman you see mama, and every man you see daddy. I soon found myself in Los Angeles City Orphanage. I was nine or 10. I remember asking the staff over and over, where is my mother? I miss my mother. And they just said, she's dead. However, Marilyn's mother was not dead. In 1934, Gladys had a severe mental breakdown. She was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and lived in and out of hospital. As we look at these photos of young orphan Norma Jean, it's hard to believe that she would become one of the most iconic stars in Hollywood. We talked to Marilyn's old school teacher, Mabel Ella Campbell. Here is what she said about this young girl. She was a youngster who uh, looked as though she, she wasn't well cared for. Her clothes separated her a little bit from the rest of the girls. She uh, was like a little girl, not well developed as some of the youngsters were. She just seemed like a, a nice child, but but not very outgoing and not very vibrant. My mother had a great friend called Grace, Grace Goddard, who became my legal guardian. It got me out of the orphanage, sure, but I moved around a lot at this time, living with relatives and friends, friends of Grace's. I came back to live with Grace and her husband when I was 16. Grace and her husband were going to West Virginia for work. And you see, California child protection laws prevented them from taking me along. They wanted to put me in a home like I'd been before. Or I could marry this boy, who was 21 at the time. You see, I had to make a choice. It was just after my 16th birthday when I dropped out of high school to marry James. He was my neighbor. And so I became a housewife. When James was sent off for the Marines, I moved in with my new in-laws. Here is what James Dougherty had to say about the marriage. 
my mother and Grace decided it might be a good idea, Norma Jean, and I got married. And uh, I guess the next day or the same day, I don't know, Mom asked me if I would like to marry Norma Jean. And the thought runs through my mind, this is, this is a very young child. Uh, at 21, you feel like you're a pretty grown-up man. So I agreed to it anyhow with the thought that I would be going into the service soon. And she would have a home with my mother while I was gone. She was a good cook. And I recall that she always liked to mix uh, carrots with peas because of the color. Not because she liked to eat them, but she just liked the color of them. They look good on a plate. You know, I never knew uh, Marilyn Monroe. I knew Norma Jean, Norma Jean Doherty, Norma Jean Baker. But Marilyn Monroe and Norma Jean were two different people. Norma Jean was uh, my wife. Marilyn Monroe was a glamorous movie star. I don't know anything about her life. I never talked to her. I just didn't know her. As James is sent off for war, like many other women, young Norma joined the war effort. During the war, I worked as a technician for radio plane. When a man comes in with a camera wanted to photograph us, they seemed to like the photos. I signed with Blue Book Agency soon after that. Norma Jean looked like the girl next door, and I thought I could make her into something quite marketable in a short length of time. She was very beautiful in a clean-cut, American, wholesome way. Emmeline Snively ran the Blue Book Modeling Agency. We taught her photographic modeling, how to pose, how to handle your body, smile. She was always trying to lower her smile because she smiled too high, and that made her nose a little long. She had a different kind of knees than other girls. She couldn't just relax her knees and walk smoothly, but every time she'd take a step, her knees would go all the way back and make her bounce. I used to appear on men's magazine covers. It was pinup style, morale boosting stuff. It was one cover, Laugh, that got me my first contract with 20th Century Fox. The world finally felt like it was opening up to me. Towards the end of the war, I divorced James. I've always had too much fantasy to, to be only a housewife. It was that fantasy that would be the catalyst for Marilyn's career in show business. Is it safe to say, Marilyn, your life has always been intertwined with movies? Why, yes. I guess I was always aware of my mother's involvement in working at the studios. And from visiting the theaters, I became really interested in the actors over anything. Jean Harlow and Clark Gable were my favorites. I even used to pretend, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, I used to pretend Clark was my father. Marilyn was at Fox for six months the first time, acting in films such as Dangerous Years and Scudder Who, Scudder Hey. Funny tonight. Am I going to see you later? I'm not too tired. But Evie, I thought we had a date. Look, this tray weighs a ton. That's when I got my name. I wanted the name Monroe. That was my mother's maiden name. He said I reminded him of Jean Harlow and Marilyn Miller. And he said Marilyn went better with Monroe. From then on, I became her. I became Marilyn Monroe.
what people don't realize is there's always been a persona. As much as a gown would be put on and taken off at the end of the night. However, her rise to the upper echelons of celebrity would not be so straightforward. In 1947, her contract was not renewed due to the studio seeing her as too shy and insecure to have a future in acting. We spoke to Marilyn's first motion picture agent, Harry Lipton. She was thought of as a joke by many people. And uh, I think this hurt her very deeply because she was very serious. I told Marilyn when Fox had uh, dropped her option and her immediate reaction was the world had crashed around her ears and unhappiness and tears. And then typical of Marilyn, she shook her head, set her jaw and said, well, it really doesn't matter. After all, it's a case of supply and demand. Although this insecurity would follow her throughout her life, she had never been one to give up. The following year, Marilyn signed with Columbia, acting in low-budget pictures. Columbia put me in this terrible picture called Ladies of the Chorus. And then they dropped me after six months. in your direction tells the world my heart is filled with nothing but affection lock me in your arms forever that's the place i want to be so anyone can see that i belong to you and you belong to Money was always a problem back in those days. So after Columbia dropped me, I couldn't get movie roles. I went back to modeling, like I'd always done during the war. I had this one photographer who would work with me often. He would always call me asking me, you know, can you do nudes? And I'd say, no, no, no. But as a girl gets so far behind in her rent, you do find yourself answering that telephone call. The photographer's name was Tom Kelly. When I first asked her to do it, like she uh, turned me down. But after thinking it over for a few days, when she came back and said, I, I would like to do it. I think it was partially uh, a favor. I had done her a favor once before, and she really did need the money. This is a negative of the calendar of Maryland that sold 8 million copies. It just happened to be a darn good shot. I give all the credit to her. I was in debt. Couldn't pay my rent. So I called him up and said, are you sure they won't recognize me? I made sure that he shot it at night with no one on set. And he promised no one would know it was me. I felt deathly shy, exposed. I look forward to forgetting it ever happened. But of course, that simple shoot became notorious. The calendar was, of course, called Golden Dreams. The images would eventually feature in the very first issue of Playboy magazine. The calendar alone would end up selling 8 million copies. There was an expectation that Marilyn would deny it was her in the photos. Why would I deny it? I was broke and I needed the money. In these financially turbulent years, it wasn't just saucy calendars that Marilyn would feature in. Let's watch as she acts in an advertisement for Royal Triton Motor Oil. This is the first car I ever owned. I call her Cynthia. She's going to have the best care a car ever had. Put Royal Triton in Cynthia's little tummy. Right, lady. Cynthia will just love that Royal Triton. It wouldn't be until 1950 that we would see Marilyn's first critically acclaimed roles. She starred in John Mankiewicz's All About Eve. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. I've got to make him happy. 
and John Houston's The Asphalt Jungle. Haven't you bothered me enough, you big banana head? Just try breaking my door, and Mr. Emmick will throw you out of the house. Afraid not, miss. He's got troubles enough. As a matter of fact, he's a dead duck. Through her hard work, she signed a second contract in 1951 with 20th Century Fox. She would continue to play roles which typecast her as the dumb blonde. In her next film, We're Not Married, her role as a beauty pageant contestant is said to have been created solely to present her in two bathing suits, according to its writer. Mississippi! <laughs> Hold this, will you? It was when I was making these movies that I really did become fascinated by the film process. I mean, gee, since I was a girl, I'd loved the movies. Everything about it enchanted me. I learned to dance and act. I did a few comedies early on, As Young As You Feel, Love Nest, and Let's Make It Legal. They weren't very popular. I was aware I was playing a dumb blonde. I was very good at playing it. Aren't you here early? Oh, yes. Mr. Oxley's been complaining about my punctuation, so I'm careful to get here before nine. But I wanted to be an actress, not just this blonde ornament people talked about. Is there anything I can do for you? What a ridiculous statement. Mr. Grayman, I want you to help me. I have a little sand left. What seems to be the trouble? Some men are following me. Really? I can't understand why. On July 1st, 1953, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is released, which we can all agree has become one of Maryland's most iconic film roles. The studio heads at Fox kept saying to me, Oh, Marilyn, remember, you're not a star. When I would do so much as request a trailer, I said, Well, whatever I am, I am the blonde, and it is gentlemen for blondes. Her performance of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend will go down in Hollywood history. Strictly platonic, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. And I think affairs that you must give will Sonic a better bet. If little pets get big baguettes, time rolls on, and youth is gone, and you can't straighten... The people made me a star. No studio, no person decided that, but the people did. And the people really do adore you, Marilyn. Honor and pride and pleasure, I present this citation to you. Thank you. I'd like to present to you the Look Achievement Award as the most outstanding feminine newcomer of 1952. Thank you, Lillian. And as best young box office personality, Miss Marilyn Monroe. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Marilyn Monroe, the movie doors of America voted you the most popular actress of the year. My congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. It was around this time that I met Joe. We married in San Francisco. He understood something about me, and I understood something about him, and we based our marriage on it.
On mine and Joe's honeymoon, I soon realized how much my fame had increased. Your pandemonium reigns in Tokyo as Joe DiMaggio, the once great Yankee Clipper, extends the field of the Monroe Doctrine by bringing his beautiful star bride to the land of the cherry blossoms. Having demonstrated how to marry a millionaire in a comedy masterpiece of film, Marilyn shows she knows how to manage millions by taking her multitudinous reception in stride. There hasn't been anything like Marilyn and Joe in all of Japan's history, and the photogs make the most of it. Proving curves that can get a great batter have also... A honeymoon in Japan was combined with his business trip. Soon after, I traveled to Korea, where I sang for the soldiers. The highlight of my life was singing for the souls there. I stood out on an open stage and it was cold, but I swear I didn't feel a thing except good. In 1954, the seven-year itch created shockwaves through America. Oh, I think it's terrific. Very nice, some girl. I think it's very nice, but I'd rather it were me. I said, what has Marilyn Monroe got that a million other women have and prefer not to show? I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, that's pretty vulgar, I mean. For Marilyn, it would be the year that she finally settled her battle to be taken seriously by Fox. What followed was the promise of a new contract, a bonus of $100,000, and a starring role in the film adaptation of the Broadway success, The Seven Year Itch. It was The Seven Year Itch that made Joe really mad. It wasn't the sole reason for our marriage falling apart, but his fury did show me how different we really were. It was a comedy part, but I couldn't really find the comedy in my life. Joe was very angry over the subway great scene, he stormed across the set, leaving the scene. The cameras cut, the crew went home, but I had to deal with the fallout. If there was ever to be an enduring image of Marilyn, this would be it. Standing over a subway grate, Marilyn's character lets the breeze lift her white dress. Oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? It was shot on Lexington Avenue in Manhattan and attracted nearly 2,000 spectators. It cemented her status as a sex symbol. Now, when people say this, this sex symbol thing, I don't quite understand. To me, symbols have always been something you clash together. But to be a sex symbol is to become a thing rather than a person. I don't want to be just a thing. That's the trouble. I guess out of all the symbols of things, to be a symbol of sex isn't too bad. But you see, it was always sex symbol this and dumb blonde that. I've always found it interesting, or peculiar, that people can so easily associate, if you have blonde hair, and if you're in fine shape, that you must be absolutely dumb. You're considered dumb. I don't know how this very limited view came to be. I don't think something like how a person looks or the color of their hair matters to their intelligence. Shortly following the seven-year itch, Marilyn and Joe would divorce. There were rumors of a violent fight that occurred after the infamous shoot. Yes, I guess everyone heard about that in the papers. Our marriage wasn't a happy one. And, well, it ended in nine months, unfortunately. Miss Monroe will have nothing to say this morning. Uh, all I can say as her attorney is that this is what we would say with the conflict of career. 
And as incredible as it may be, uh, it will have to be full strength and run it in the proper place at the proper time. I said, oh, nothing at all. If it's love, there is no in between. Why begin and cry for something that might And so, I left Hollywood, Los Angeles, California, my childhood home for the East Coast. Me and my dear friend Milton found our own production company. Oh, well, you're a happy girl now. When you when you go to London. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, Marilyn, yes, I'm, okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm much happier though. I'm very pleased. Is it true that you uh, submitted a list of directors <clears throat> you would work with? Um. We only know the rumors we hear, you know. I would rather say um, that I have direct approval, and that is true. This you think is important? Yes, it is. Very important to me. You're wearing a high hat. Yes. Now, the last time I saw you mm. wear it, is it the blue gown and the style? No, I'm the same person, but it's a different suit. <laughs> I wanted agency. I was sick of being only seen as a sex symbol. I would like a variety of parts. I moved to Manhattan not long after. I was attracted by the poets and artists that lived in the city. My acting teacher, Lee Strasberg, and his wife, Paula, they took me under their wing. I have a desire to be considered an artist, too, you know? I started their method of acting. Marilyn always dreamt of being an actress. She didn't, by the way, dream of being a star. She dreamt of being an actress. And she had always lived somehow with that dream. And that is why, despite the fact that she became one of the unusual and outstanding stars of all time, she herself was never satisfied. When she came to New York, she began to perceive the possibilities of really accomplishing her dream of being an actress. Although Los Angeles is where I was born, I feel like New York, I finally found my home at last. When I no longer am tied to work in Hollywood, I think I retired to Brooklyn. It's my favorite place in the world. It's true that I haven't traveled much, but I don't think I'll ever find anywhere that will replace Brooklyn. In New York, Marilyn met a certain playwright by the name of Arthur Miller. An unlikely pairing. However, by 1956, they were married. Can you tell us what kind of a wedding you're going to have? Very quiet, I hope. Uh, do you feel certain at this time that you will be able to get away to go to England? I feel certain I'm going to try, Arthur. In the event that you are not able to go, will Miss Monroe still go? Oh, sure. She's got to go. She's got a contract to go. Well, that means you may not have a honeymoon together then. I think we will. I hope so. In March 1959, Marilyn won a Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Comedy or Musical for her role in Some Like It Hot. The film was a smash hit. Don't say that. There must be some girl someplace that could be. If I ever found a girl that could, I'd marry you just like that. Would you do me a favor? Certainly. What is it? I may not be Dr. Freud or a male brother or one of those French upstairs girls, but could I take another crack at it? All right, if you insist.
anything this time? I'm afraid not. Terribly sorry. However, stories from behind the scenes revealed it was a particularly tumultuous production. Stories of tardiness and endless retakes flooded the papers. I've always said, you know, that an actor is not a machine. I'm sure I'm not the only person on those film sets that has, I don't know, real quirky problems. It just happens that my problem is one that shows. <laughs> I'm late. People say, gee, that Marilyn is an arrogant girl. Simply not true. If anything, I'm the opposite. When I'm on set, I'm concerned solely with giving my best performance I can. I pour myself completely into those roles, to the best of my ability. Anyway, I've seen plenty of people be on time and do the opposite, chit-chatting away. Gable says about me, when she's there, she's there. All of her is there. She's there to work. Things did take a turn for the worse for Marilyn after Some Like It Hot. During this time, she unfortunately experienced problems with her health, which ultimately ended up affecting her work. Like I said before, an actor is not a machine. They may work you like you are one. An endless American rush, go, 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 fast for no reason. But as actors, we get sick too. We are humans, we feel. Some days we are gay, and other days we're sick. It's true that I've been unwell. I have problems like anyone else. The only difference is my prescription note somehow gets on the front page of the New York Times. In 1959, Marilyn starred in the musical comedy, Let's Make Love. While tearing off a game I may make a play for the caddy, but when I do, I don't follow through, cause my heart belongs to daddy. However, once more, the production was marred by frequent absences. The Misfits was released in 1961. It was written by Arthur Miller. Marilyn played the role of divorcee Rosalind, who became friends with three aging cowboys. once more was affected by her declining health. She would spend a week in a hospital detox and underwent surgery for her endometriosis. The chronic pain in her physical and emotional life would be one of the reasons she would begin to increase her usage of barbiturates. Shooting The Misfits also proved to be difficult for Marilyn and Arthur's marriage. The pair disagreed about the direction of the script. Marilyn and Arthur would file for divorce once production was over. When you're an actor or embraced by fame and the public in any way, suddenly the secrets you once kept for yourself are opened for the public world. 
I let the whole world into my life through the roles I play, into these secrets and emotions. But it's outside of the movies that everyone is tugging for more. Everyone wants a chunk of you. When you're famous, just like how your image and name is blown up, enlarged on billboards or theater projections, so are all your weaknesses. Any other job, if you have a cold, you can stay home. The executive get a cold, they phone in. But if an actor gets a cold, it's all, you can't get a cold, how dare you get a cold? Gee, I wish they would have to act a comedy with a temperature. On May 19th, Marilyn sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President, on stage at President John F. Kennedy's early birthday celebration. Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. On that stage, with the light on me, I looked up all the way to the very top of the rafters. I thought that perhaps if I wasn't Marilyn Monroe, I'd be right up there, my head close to the ceiling after paying my two dollars to get in. Monroe has suffered from psychiatric disturbance for a long time. She had often expressed wishes to give up, to withdraw, and even to die. On more than one occasion in the past, when disappointed and depressed, she had made a suicide attempt using sedative drugs. On these occasions, she had called for help and had been rescued. 
From the information collected about the events of the evening of August the 4th, it is our opinion that the same pattern was repeated except for the rescue. On the basis of all the information obtained, it is our opinion that the case is a probable suicide. Less than three months after her Madison Square Garden performance on August 4th, 1962, Marilyn Monroe died of a barbiturate overdose. She was 36 years old. goes by, fades and passes you, and so long. Me and Faye have been together for long enough. I've always known it was fickle. So if it does pass me by, at least I've experienced it for this long. But it's not where I live. <laughs> 